As Marie said, my name is Emma Farrell and over the last two years I've had the privilege of leading the Belonging Project here in UCD. So today's webinar is, is all about the Belonging Project and more specifically that question of belonging in the post-pandemic university. I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about myself and the factors that influence my own approach to belonging. We'll consider that setting of the post-pandemic university and try to chart some of the features of this very moment in time. Following this, I'll present some evidence around belonging. What is it and what has it got to do with higher education, as well as some ways of exploring and understanding belonging. Of course, primarily, I'll be talking about the Belonging Project and what we learned about belonging or, or not belonging here in UCD. Uh, up until about half an hour ago, I wasn't sure if I'd include this slide, but uh, this is a photograph here of me almost 20 years ago in my first job in UCD. I was one of a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens, as Margaret Mead would say, that ultimately went on to found what is now Jigsaw, Ireland's National Centre for Youth Mental Health. My 13 years with Jigsaw, both as a staff member and as a board member, were extremely formative, not only in how I think about youth mental health, but how I approach complex challenges such as disconnection, loneliness or vulnerability. For those who may not know, Jigsaw is a free community-based early intervention and prevention mental health service for young people aged 12 to 25 that's in communities all over Ireland. There are three big influences that uh, really shaped my experience both in Jigsaw and throughout my career, and I think you'll see them very strongly in the Belonging Project. I guess I'm, I'm naming my bias. The first is a focus on context. For the first 10 years, Jigsaw's tagline was changing how Ireland thinks about youth mental health. It wasn't Ireland's number one mental health service or even you know helping young people but recognise that a crisis in youth mental health required not just opening new centres or services, but a whole change in thinking about how we approach and respond to youth mental health. The founding director of Jigsaw, Dr. Tony Bates, used to use this kind of gruesome analogy of a, a skin graft in thinking about how can we respond to the wound or to the distress of young people. He would say that, when you're trying to graft skin onto a burn wound, you, you can't just come in and impose the graft, but you must need to think about the context, the, the wound itself, and try and respond and, and be attending to the wound itself in order for it to be effective. And I think that sense of context, of trying to stay as close to context and what's going on for people is something that you'll see in the Belonging Project and what we've managed to do. Second, Jigsaw is not a psychology or a psychiatric service, but rather brings together professionals from all different disciplinary backgrounds, but also young people and their families and communities. There was a recognition that when it comes to young people in distress, it wasn't so much about bringing in expertise, but rather Everybody holds a piece of the jigsaw and it's about trying to bring all of those pieces together in a way that most effectively responded to the crisis in youth mental health. Finally, I learned a lot about the importance of listening and understanding. I had the privilege of meeting countless young people and their families who shared stories of triumph and of tragedy. Yet when I was studying, I found little more than snippets of these stories in the psychology textbooks or research papers. So I took time out from Jigsaw and I did a PhD where I developed a methodology based on the principles of hermeneutic phenomenology in order to, in order to understand or at least get as close to, as possible to lived experience and translate this lived experience into policy and practice. This is what I've continued to do in the years since and really influences so much of my work and my research. I think you'll see it very much in the, the Belonging Project. And I think this focus on context, interdisciplinarity and lived experience really is at the heart of the Belonging Project, which we'll talk about as we go along. So what are we talking about when we talk about the post-pandemic university? As we all know, COVID-19 arrived here in February uh, 2020. Universities closed in March 2020, and I certainly felt like 
this was only going to be a short term thing. We'll be all all back in our offices in just a couple of weeks. But of course, it didn't pan out like that at all. There are two caveats I'd like to offer when speaking about COVID-19 and mental health. The first one is that everyone's experience was different. So while I'm presenting some larger scale data and trends, we all know that they'll fail miserably to capture individual experiences, which varied enormously. The second caveat is that there is often a disjoint in between broad data trends and the social and political narrative around mental health. I think we'll all, all remember those kind of terrifying headlines of a tsunami of mental illness. I think it's been a really interesting time to be a mental health researcher, and I, I think that will it'll take many years to unfurl really what was said and what happened. Um, but the broader train, trends in relation to the post-pandemic were that, interestingly, general mental health didn't change through the early stages of the, the pandemic. Some studies actually report improvements in mental health, depending on which group you were interested in. But it didn't stay like that. As the pandemic wore on, people struggled a lot more and some people struggled more than others. We know that certain groups were particularly affected, including people who lived alone, people who lived in poorer quality housing. And this was particularly interesting because it included not just people who lived in precarious housing, who were renting or who were in kind of crowded housing, but people who had access to green spaces had a much better chance of reporting higher levels of mental health and well-being. We also know that frontline workers were particularly impacted, as were people with caring responsibilities. Loneliness, housing, challenging working conditions and care. These are issues that continue to challenge our society four years on from the beginning of the pandemic. These are the issues, or at least some of the issues, that really undermine people's mental health and well-being. Focusing a little bit more on the student experience, we know that the subjective well-being of young people decreased during the pandemic. And I'm pointing here to some excellent research carried out by the SRI using Growing Up in Ireland data. The authors attribute this decrease in subjective well-being to young people losing their job, finding it difficult to study, and less face-to-face -face contact with friends. This factor of reduced face-to-face -face contact with friends just came up over and over again. And the big themes that came through all of the data really center on disrupted relationships, increased loneliness, reduced belonging. And I think this is particularly true for university students. We all know students who hadn't set foot on the UCD campus until their third year and who missed out on all the rites of passage and rituals that define the university, like everything from inductions to getting your UCD scarf to being involved in all of the different weeks and transitions that take place through the year. There's also some evidence to say that they let the pandemic and the lockdowns led to delayed developmental transitions in young people. So what's this all got to do with belonging? And I think more particularly, well, what is belonging? How do we define this word that we've heard so much of and is certainly so present in our post-pandemic lives? I've worked with a number of definitions of belonging and decided to create my own that incorporates three key components. So belonging is the need to be part of something bigger than ourselves, to experience real connectedness for who we are and what we bring to the world. The three parts of this are belonging as a need. And we talk quite a lot about a sense of belonging or a feeling of belonging. But researchers have really come to recognize belonging as one of those irreducible needs, along with safety and love, that is so essential to our well-being and flourishing as human beings. The second is that being part of something bigger than ourselves. And in some ways, this feels almost like a radical act in a world that is very much focused on the individual and on competition. And finally, belonging is about real connectedness for who we are and what we bring to the world. It's only when we can be ourselves, be seen and be accepted for who we are, that we can feel like we belong. And this is one of the big distinctions in defining belonging and in belonging as a research area in particular. There's a big debate about what's the difference between belonging and fitting in. I love this. Uh, this is a screenshot of, of a part of a book from Brené Brown, and she has this lovely distinction between belonging and fitting in. She says that 
you know, belonging is being accepted for you. Fitting in is being accepted for being like everyone else. I think we all try to fit in and probably no bad thing in some ways. But we, we feel like we'll only be accepted if we're like somebody else. If we counter or control our own instincts then we're never going to feel like we belong or we're acceptable for who we really are. And it's that sense of being seen and being accepted that makes belonging connectedness so powerful and, and so protective for well-being. Given that it's an irreducible need, it's perhaps unsurprising that belonging is a phenomenon that has been explored and examined through many disciplinary lenses. Psychology, for example, has is full of measures of belonging, and there's some really effective ones out there. These are just some of the scales that are often used to measure sense of belonging in university students. I'd like to draw attention to the work of our colleague in ECD, Dr. Catherine Mooney, who's been collecting data on student sense of belonging in computer science and in more broadly in science for a number of years. It's a phenomenal data set and a huge amount of, of research that gives us such important information. These data provide really useful insights into broader trends in relation to belonging and trends across time. And I'll be sharing some of these in a moment. Social science, sociology, and if I might be so bold, even lump in anthropology here too, have studied belonging for hundreds of years, really. If you think about Durkheim's work on suicide in the late 1800s to more contemporary research that highlights how belonging is fundamental to social capital, that pillar of belonging is seen throughout social science research, and there's some excellent work out there. I'd like to point to the work of my colleague and fellow Wexford native, Dr. Viv Rath, whose excellent research on the university ex experiences of disabled students found that belonging was critical to success in higher education for these students. I'm going to keep moving along here, but I'd like to acknowledge the increasing emphasis on belonging in education. Professor of Inclusive Education in Trinity College, College Professor Michael Shevlin, who's really led the way in uh, higher education for students with intellectual disabilities. Michael would say that if you're doing inclusion right, what you're doing is belonging. What you're creating is a sense of belonging. And I think that's just such a powerful idea. This type of research or this approach to understanding belonging yields such important insights and data. And I'd just like to focus on some of the highlights here. And if there's anybody who'd like to see a little bit more of the papers or the research, I'd be really happy to share these after it. But we know on a broad scale from research conducted with students all over the world that underrepresented groups, there's underrepresented racial, racial or ethnic minority groups and first generation students report relatively lower sense of belonging compared to peers. We also know that feeling a sense of belonging is associated with positive mental health and lower attrition. And this is particularly important right now, as we see in the last few weeks, reports from the HEA about increased dropout for first year students in university and poorer levels of, of mental health and well-being. So it's really good to know that there is something we can do. And thirdly, we know that there's a positive association between sense of belonging and academic outcomes. There's a lot tied up in this around privilege and social capital. But if we want to be really quite crude about it, we know that students who feel like they belong do better in university. But it's not just social sciences that offer us an insight into belonging. It's perhaps no, not surprising that uh, two members of the Belonging Project team are philosophers. And, I personally have been so inspired by the work of my colleague, Dr. Anya Mahan, in terms of how philosophy can help us understand and illuminate aspects of education and mental health. I'd like to share this quote in full from Norgard and Bengstein, because I think it just gives us an example of how philosophy as an entry point provides such a rich and unique perspective on what we really mean when we talk about belonging. So they say that when we speak of the university as a place and not merely a space, we speak of it as, as a place where people with Heidegger's term dwell. It is not an empty container to be filled with the conceptual spirit or concrete flesh of the people occupying these spaces. The university is, it, itself is a force of being. And by dwelling there, we have become absorbed into this being. Accordingly, the university is not just a space we occupy in a specific time span during the day, 
when we teach or attend classes or maintain and develop the infrastructure of our department or faculty. Rather, the university becomes part of our broader life world. While the social sciences can so effectively map and describe belonging as it's experienced by students, I just love how the idea of a university as a force of being changes, or at least change my perspective on belonging as it's experienced within the university environment, as it moves and as it breathes and as it's quashed or supported in the broader life world that is the university. Literature too can open our understanding of belonging or not belonging in a university in a way that kind of bypasses the brain and reaches into our own intuition or our own gut and personal experience. We have, we're so lucky in Ireland to have almost a whole genre devoted to the experience of being in university, um, including our own UCD professor, Emily Pine, who was one of the expert reviewers on the Belonging Project, as well as the presenter, at the Belonging Project seminar in Mali. So we've explored the context of the post-pandemic university, defined belonging and, and what's it got to do with UC or university experience. I think what I'm probably most excited to do is to tell you about the Belonging Project, what we learned from students and staff about the experience of belonging in UCD. The Belonging Project began back in early 2022 with a sense of dissatisfaction around the narrative that was forming about students and about staff. There was this kind of sense of students were snowflakes and that they weren't resilient and that they were struggling with their mental health and struggling to come back. Equally, staff were almost seen as work shy and kind of reluctant to come back to campus. I felt that these narratives were doing a disservice to the wonderful people that make up the life world that is the university. And instead of focusing on the negatives, I really wanted to focus on the positives and try to imagine and evoke a sense of the opposite of disconnection, of belonging. Uh, I first reached out to two colleagues in the School of Education, Dr. Anya Mann, who I've already mentioned and who I work with on a project called Thinkful, and to Shane Bergen, who in addition to having a gift for communication and engagement is also my husband, so he's going to be dragged into it whether he wanted to or not. From there, we connected with our colleague, Dr. Lisa Foran in philosophy, who's done some really interesting work on Irish identity and belonging. And we applied to the UCD College of Social Sciences and Law seed funding for a very small pot of money. I should probably say that this whole project has been run on a shoestring and is largely down to the the goodwill and generosity of so many colleagues across UCD. The person who I'd describe as the linchpin in the project is Robert Farley, who is a designer and co-owner of a design studio called Post Studios. Rob has worked with Shane and Oni and I over many years and has this unique capacity to elevate a project to a whole new level. He was the one who made the connection with Claire Campion and John Slade in, UC uh, in NCAD and who really just brought that creative component to the whole project. And so with the team assembled, we put a call out to staff and students across the UCD in late 2022, and asked them to describe a time that they felt like they belonged on campus. We received dozens of poems, of stories, autobiographical reflections, and even some haiku from students and staff across the university. We received pieces from first year undergraduate students, graduate, lecturing staff, researchers, technical staff and leadership within the university, as well as alumni. So we've really got this breadth of stories and experiences from across the university. We came together then to review the submissions and brought on board the expertise of Professor Emily Pine and Louisa Cameron, who's a local bookshop owner and also reviews books on RT radio to try and help decide which pieces we would shortlist because it was a really difficult task. We set ourselves the task of identifying pieces that best evoked a sense of belonging, that kind of gave us a sense of the essence of belonging in UCD. We managed to shortlist 40 of these and handed them to NCAD's Bureau Plus students. So Bureau Plus is a year in NCAD where students, it's almost like an internship year 
where students are given projects and tasked with treating them as if they were a real world professional project. So they were tasked with creatively bringing out the essence of belonging in the written piece through their chosen medium. So that included design, illustration, motion picture, graphics, and really incredible stuff. We brought the whole project together with a wonderful day of belonging in Mali, the Museum of Literature of Ireland, Museum of Literature of Ireland in August 2023. During the day, we heard from a range of speakers who shared really diverse insights into the experience of belonging and the scholarly input of belonging. These included Professors Young and Finkelstein from the University of Colorado in the US, who set us off with a presentation on how not only students and staff feel like they belong or not within the university, but how the university belongs or not within society. We then heard from a whole range of people, from students and staff who were involved in the project, to people who are part of the UCD community, thinking about and kind of practicing belonging in lots of different ways. These included uh, Niall Breslin, Thoman Coogan, who was just retiring after many years in UCD access and lifelong learning as well as Emily Pine and many members of the, the Belonging Project team who explored belonging through literature, philosophy and design thinking. In the evening, we launched the Belonging Project exhibition. The exhibition was formally launched by Professor Orla Feely from UCD and Professor Sarah Glenny from NCAD. But mostly the evening was about bringing together UCD students, staff and NCAD, NCAD students who actually met for the first time on the evening. And it was really wonderful to see just how their pieces had been transformed and interpreted and, and kind of creatively exhibited. It was a really great, great day. So what did we learn about belonging and the post-pandemic university from this creative interdisciplinary project? Well, we learned about place, people, places, environments, and experiences that both cultivate and quash belonging on campus. For each of these, I'm going to focus on just one example. Um, I'm also going to share the, the artwork that went along with the story and the piece. But unfortunately, I can only really focus on students in this case, partially because of the uh, invitation from the, the Centre for Studies in Higher Education. I know this is a particular focus of theirs, but also just in terms of time. I think sometimes when we think about the university, we tend to focus on students or on staff. But as we learn through this project, there's so many people, so many layers of experience that make up that life world of the university. So many of the accounts that we received spoke of the people in the university who facilitated or were catalysts for belonging. After almost 20 years of working in mental health, I've yet to find a pill or a treatment or an initiative that can come close to just the power of that human and interpersonal connection. Maimuna shared her story of coming to college and I'm going to read a quote directly from her. She said, as a, a female Nigerian asylum seeker living in the direct provision system and oh, I was pregnant and a mature student. Maimuna spoke about how she, and I quote again, felt dirty, exposed, out of place, with nothing but my need to belong and my passion for education. She described at length the support she received from UCD Access and Lifelong Learning, as well as her lecturers and fellow students. But she also talked about how at a certain point in her college experience, she was removed, moved to a different uh, direct provision centre far away from UCD and was really concerned that this was basically the end of her college experience. But the people in UCD Access and Lifelong Learning and the UCD Students' Union, she spoke about these two in particular, really came to the fore and, and helped her out. And I'm going to just share a quote again from her piece. She said, they helped her by listening to me, understanding that I was not crazy to fight, acting on that understanding by calling me, emailing me, proposing ways of solving my problem. They really kept me going. I saw that I was not crazy to want an education as an asylum seeker and as a mother. I found my place in UCD. This school has not only offered me a rare opportunity to be able to study, it has supported me and kept me in. I think that that idea is so powerful, the people who keep us in. And so many of the people or the pieces that we received spoke about these people. 
They came in all shapes and sizes and from all corners of the university and even outside of it. Perhaps the most powerful resource in cultivating belonging are the people that exist within the life world, within the university itself. In terms of places, there were so many places in which students and staff described feeling like they belonged, from the quiet corner in the library to the American football team to the engineering lake or Belfield FM, the places in which students felt like they could be themselves, could be seen, could be welcomed and accepted for who they were. It's just so diverse and so interesting. I actually decided to share Mark's story with you today, if only as a reflection on how belonging is more than just belonging to the physical space of the Belfield campus, but also to a, a place in time, in culture, and in that kind of long chain of, of students that come through the university campus. Mark's piece was called The Bernard Shaw Legacy, referring to the Richmond Street pub rather than to the playwright. He described how he and his friends were the first batch of Generation Z and was re were ready to counter their millennial predecessors and take to the streets. He talked about um, going to all of these different pubs and clubs, and you can see Lauren, who is a student in NCAD, who selected Mark's piece. She went around to all these different places and took photographs of them and did just a fantastic piece. But Mark just had this lovely uh, description about going to the Bernard Show, about going through the doors and getting asked for his passport that had been damaged since the deaths, and they got in and all the different layers and clubs and music and culture that existed within the place. But he then goes on to describe the decline of what he calls the era of hype and how Dublin started going through some sort of weird neoliberal colonization. He talked about hotelification, it's been called. And after two and a half years of a grueling pandemic, so many of these clubs faced extinction alongside its culture. When we think about belonging on culture and campus, we think about the clubs and the societies and all the places that give people an opportunity to meet and to feel like they belong, to be themselves. But there's also this really important layer about the kind of things in universities that allow belonging to grow organic, organically, that whole student culture and activism and energy, places that change and with each successive generation of students that come through the door sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse. The third thing we learned about was how the wider environment or context shapes students' experiences of belonging or non-belonging in a post-pandemic university. We received so many stories charting the impact of the housing crisis and the cost of living crisis on students' ability just to simply be, to, to be on campus, to be together or to belong. Adam was one student and he spoke about how he has to commute every day from Wexford and takes about four hours in a round trip. He just wrote a piece and, and he wrote about it in the third person describing how he felt like a spectator in university. He also described how he'd have to get up at 5.30 in the morning just to run to catch the bus in time for his first lecture. It was really interesting to read Adam's piece and to see that he actually didn't feel like he belonged on campus. Interestingly, he met another student from his course who was on the same bus. For Adam, belonging wasn't found within the university, but rather found on the bus commuting to and from the university. It's a really unusual experience, but it kind of highlights just how belonging can be found in the most unusual of places. Finally, belonging was found and nurtured not only in the people, places or environments, but in the experiences that students had or people had while at university. We heard so many of these and I think one of my personal favourites was from a colleague who's a, a member of the technical staff and he described how the day he knew he belonged in UCD was when he got a call from the front desk and someone said that they'd found a blowtorch in one of the lecture theatres and figured it must be his. He was like, he had been seen for who he is in the university. Well, one of the other stories I'd like to share comes from a mature student called Margaret, who talked about coming back to university in her 60s and describing feeling like an imposter and wanting to wear a paper bag over her head. She just described feeling completely out of place. But it was through a group assignment working on a book called The Wife of Bath that she was kind of I won't say forced, but was given the experience from working with some of those bright young students that she spoke about. 
she found out that actually they had a lot in common and that they benefited from her experience and from her insights. They did a podcast and she just described how transformative that experience was. Towards the end, she just wrote about how as I sat in the lecture hall with my now buddies, I felt an enormous amount of camaraderie. After that, I joined the students at coffee breaks and outside of campus. I joined them if they sat on the bus I was on. I felt I really belonged thanks to the wife of Bath. In fact, I probably always did. I'd just like to share some concluding thoughts. The Belonging Project received such a positive response from so many people across UCD. And I'd particularly like to thank Professor Orla Feely, who spoke about the project in her inaugural address, but also to Professor Colin Scott and college principal, Professor Neve Moore-Cherry, who really taken that theme of belonging and championed it within the college and, and in thinking about the university's strategic direction. The project captured a very unique moment in the university's history and did so in a way that was interdisciplinary, creative and really engaged. We learned a lot about belonging in UCD, about the people, the places, the environments and the experiences that in which cult cultivate and support belonging. We did more than measure or chart belonging, even though these things are really important. But we tried to step into the life world of the university and explore the experience of belonging at a very unique moment in our history. The project is winding down. I myself am leaving UCD in a couple of weeks, but the exhibition, which is currently on display in the UCD village, will be archived for posterity in the UCD special collections and in the artwork that will continue to be exhibited online at belonging.ie. I'd like to finish today with one final story. This is a story shared by UCD alumnus, Dr. John Callaghan, who was an undergraduate in UCD almost 60 years ago when the College of Science building was in Merrion Street, what's, what's now government buildings. John wrote about ag dances in the Olympic ballroom and the games of poker he would play with his classmates under the stairs and between lectures. He was one of the first generation of Irish students to go to the US to study for a PhD under the post-war Marshall Plan and bring all of that learning back to UCD when he was a professor in agriculture. John has been a mentor to generations of UCD students and staff, including myself, and has been a key donor to UCD Champions Opening Doors Alumni Fund, which provides scholarships to students who might otherwise not be able to attend university. I share this story as a reminder that investing in belonging is investing in a generation and the generation after that and the generation after that. Nurturing belonging may not yield the kind of quick wins or easily quantifiable results that we might expect of interventions or of investments, but I would argue that it has the potential to be the most meaningful and lasting investment that any university can make, particularly in this post-pandemic era. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, 